Derry, can you hear me now? Okay. Good morning. Good morning. It's April. It's a beautiful day outside. I don't know where you are. Most of you are probably in Columbus. It's a gorgeous day. We have had some excellent weather. Um, I love it. I love it. I love it. It's the perfect time where you don't need a, well, you might need a sweater in the morning, but by the afternoon, it's just lovely, just lovely. So welcome. Good morning. Happy April. Happy Easter. It's the last of Jonah. Um, it's going to be good. It's going to be really good. Um, lots of things to learn. Lots and lots of things to learn. So we'll jump in and then I'll, I'll tell you what we're going to do next. Okay. So Jonah chapter three is where we were, where we left off. Now remember, Jonah has been in the bod in the belly of a fish because he refused to do what God commanded him to do. Um, so he was swallowed by the fish and spent three days there, three days, three nights, the time that will prove that you're dead. Um, so we um, so then he spits it so Jonah has this this prayer. This good prayer, this this prayer that he that he says, and he repents of his. He said, "I will do whatever you ask me to do. I'm going to go." So, when the and the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Okay, so Jonah, this is what's happened. Okay, so chapter three starts. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time: Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. So we see that God has not changed His mind. He is still giving the same um, direction to Jonah that he gave the first time, okay? So it's not like the plan has changed. It is staying the same, okay? Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord this time and went to Nineveh. That, I added that this time. Um, now, Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. That means that this city had a circumference, What from what I read, of like, 60 miles. So it would have taken three days to go visit all of it. So when you add in the preaching of the message, this was going to take a little bit of a time. Okay. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw that they did and what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the, the destruction he had threatened. Does this remind y'all of anything? Um, the destruction that's going to come to Nineveh if they don't repent? It reminded me of Sodom and Gomorrah, which is in Genesis 18 and 19. So let's go there real quick. Because if you don't know... Sodom and Gomorrah was, uh, ooh, it was bad. They were naughty, naughty, naughty people. They were doing things that were just, I mean, it'll make you blush. It was bad, so bad. And so it comes to the Lord's attention, and he says, we're going to do, we're, we're going to, the Lord's going to destroy it. Lord's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because they, it, 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 we just can't take it anymore. It's gotten so bad that we just, it, that's it. That is it. I've let it go on long enough. They are wicked. They are immoral. They have, oh, it's awful. We can't let it go on anymore. So, um, so, so this is the best story. So in chapter 18, verse 16, when the men got up to leave, they looked down toward Sodom, and Abram, 
Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? And Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him. I'm going to skip down to verse 20. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great, and their sin is so grievous, that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Now, can you imagine if the Lord just showed up and just visited you with two, two of his angel buddies? I, I mean, that'd be fun, wouldn't it? Unless you're in Sodom and Gomorrah. All right. Um, so, he says, that Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the r wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of 50 righteous people in it? The Lord says in verse 26, If I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. So they go on through this. And I think even, I think even um, Abraham was like, you know what, I don't, I don't think, I don't, I, maybe there's not 50. <laughs> Abraham was even surprised, I think. Couldn't even follow up with what he was saying. So this continues. The Lord says yes. And Abraham was concerned for Sodom and Gomorrah because... His nephew Lot lived there. So Abraham works out, somebody go get Lot, tell him that this is about to happen because my nephew is a great guy. He's a good man. I mean, he's, I brought him with me. He stayed with me. He's, he's been supportive to me. So they go through. So the two people come, the two angels that were sent go, and they end up at Lot's house. So he says, my lords, please turn aside to your servant's house so you can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way. And they said, no, we will spend the night in the square. But he insisted so strongly. That's a lot. He insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. He prepared a meal for them. They were there. And Lot was like, no, 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 no. You can't just hang out here, fellas. You can't just hang out here. You got to move on. You got to come you got to come into my house. Let me let me protect you, okay? I'm not going to get into what happened. Go read it. Genesis 18 and 19. <laughs> it is a soap opera. So anyway, the angels told Lot, you've got to get out of here. The, the, God is going to destroy this city. Go get your family. He goes and gets his daughters, his two daughters, and, and their husbands, their betrothed to Mary. And they, he said, y'all have got to go. We've got to get out of here because the Lord is going to destroy it. The guys, the husbands didn't believe what was being said. Lot and his wife and his two daughters got up and left the city. And they had told them, do not turn back. Do not turn back. See, now I'm getting to something where y'all have heard before. They, they, they were running from the city. Lot's wife stopped and turned around to see, and she turned into a pillar of salt. That's how bad it was. That's how bad the city was. That's how <laughs> the destruction was going. And probably the reason, it seems like I heard a commentary on this story before that said the reason that Lot's wife turned into a pillar of salt, and the reason they were told to go, don't stop, don't turn around, don't pause, go, was that the destruction was going to be such devastation that it would reach them if they didn't keep moving. And she paused and stopped, and sure enough, she turned into a pillar of salt. Okay? There is an example of what happens when the Lord comes and says, hey, y'all are awful, you better quit what you're doing, or I'm going to destroy this city. This is the example of what's going to come to Nineveh. This is what's happening. And we know that these Assyrians, the Ninevites, were awful. They were warlike people. They were very fierce, very belligerent, 
very mean. So they had done all these atrocities to everyone, but especially to Israel. Okay, so this is what's going to happen. This is the picture that we see of what's going to come. Okay, so there's that bit. Here's another great thing. So when the king says, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let everyone call urgently upon the Lord. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Okay. I love this. Okay, so Psalms 42, 1 says, As a deer pants for water. Y'all know this verse. As a deer pants for water, so my soul, so my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My soul pants for you, O God. It pants for you. As a deer pants for streams of water, it's thirsty. Go to Matthew 6. Matthew 5, 6, sorry. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. The king is calling on a time of fasting. The king is calling for them to pray urgently, to turn around, to quit what they're doing. He's in this morning. They're in their morning with the sackcloth. Okay? They're, they're doing that. And he's like, we're going to fast and we're going to call on the Lord. We are going to turn from our ways. And maybe, just maybe, that fast will make them pant. Their souls pant. Now, yeah, they're going to be thirsty. They're going to pant for the righteousness. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's what Jesus says in Matthew. Okay? This is exciting too. Verse 10. Okay. Well, but the king says at the end of verse 9, he said, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that he will, so that we will not perish. Verse 10 says, when God saw that they did, what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. Okay? Look at this. Okay, okay. So, we hear it often that God, we can't change God's mind. We can't change him. He's going to do what he's going to do. I mean, who are we? Who are we that we could even... I mean, have a conversation. I mean, we're just the, the created talking to the creator. I mean, how could that, how could we ever change his mind? And then you think, well, I mean, but we pray. The Lord says if we pray and ask. So, I mean, what's the point of all of this? I read some great, great notes. First, here's, well, I'm going to go to this first. Okay, so in the book of Second Samuel, And this word for relent is in there a lot. This is repeated in the Bible, okay? So, in 2 Samuel, verse 24, uh, no, wait, chapter 24, verse 16, it says, When the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who destroyed the people, It is enough. Now relax your hand. Okay? Okay? That's what he says there. He said, it's enough. He relented. This note, see, this is my uh, MacArthur study Bible, okay? So the note in this study Bible says, I thought this was so interesting, or repented and grieved, an expression of God's deep sorrow concerning man's sin and evil, okay? Now, the other note is in Jeremiah. What was it? Jeremiah warns of judgment. In 42.10, it says, If you will indeed stay in this land, then I will build you up and not tear you down, and I will plant you and not uproot you, for I will relent concerning the calamity that I have inflicted on you. I will relent. This note says, By this God means I am satisfied with the punishment inflicted if you do not add new offenses. Okay, one more, one more, one more. It's also in Jeremiah. It's Jeremiah 8. No, 
I'm having trouble talking today. Um, Jeremiah 18, 8 says, and if that nation I warned represent, oh, represents, sorry. I told you I was having trouble talking today. Repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. Look at that. I will relent. It's not that God is changing his mind. It's that we are satisfying the holy standard that he had set up for us. He wants to destroy and come in and serve judgment to these cities and to us in our lives when we are not holding up the holy standard that he has set for us. And he's only going to let us go so long before something is going to happen. Right? Right. Shake your head. Yes, because that is true. We will only be left to our own devices to a point. There will be consequences of our unrighteousness. And you may say, but Emily, we have Jesus. I mean... We're covered. We're covered by the blood. Jesus' righteousness is my righteousness now. It's a gift. I've already claimed it. Well, that doesn't mean that you can go about doing what? That doesn't mean if somebody comes to you and say, repent, you have to quit doing this. This that you're living into and you're doing right now, that's not good. Don't do that. If you continue to ignore what's happening, if you continue down your path, if you're not repenting, if you're not turning, if you're not living up to the holy standard that God has set before you, you will have consequences. But guess what? When you repent, when God sees a people or a person who has turned and done a 180 from what they were doing and comes back to him and picks that that holy standard back up, he will relent. He will say, okay, thank you. I appreciate it. That's what I wanted you to do the whole time. What took you so long? Why did you do that? Okay. Tony Evans, and I can't, this has been, ex, I, I used this last time. Um, it's the Tony Evans Bible Commentary. It's excellent. Okay. This is what he said about it in verse 10, about that God relenting. It says, God never changes, but he can adjust to the changes in humans. While he doesn't change his holy standards, there's where I got that term, holy standards. Uh, Holy standards, he will alter his intended outcome in response to our actions. In this case, repentance produced something for his grace and mercy to respond to. Their repentance, I love that. Your repentance gives something for the grace and mercy of God to respond to. uh, It responds. He responds. Isn't that amazing? He responds to us. He responds to us. There were the Ninevites a Gentile country, a pagan country. They were not the chosen people. They were awful. They were mean. They had persecuted and killed who knows how many Israelites. There they were. And God said, if you will go and preach to them, they might repent. And then I can save Nineveh and I won't destroy it. But they have to repent. They have to turn back. They have to not do that. And he was, and Jonah knew, and of course he was right. <laughs> of course God was right. Um, Jonah knew that. 
He knew that. That's why, that's why I didn't want to go to begin with, remember? He didn't want the Ninevites to have this chance for God to respond to them with grace and mercy. He did not want them to receive that blessing that the Israelites had had. Which brings us right into chapter 4. This might be convicting. Just warning you, okay? So, Jonah's seeing this. <laughs> so, what does it say? But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Oh, Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending cl- calamity. I know this about you, God. I know you're good. I know you love people. I know you love your creation. I knew that if I came over here and told them how great you were and told them to repent, that they would and then that you would. And I don't want them to have that. I don't want them to have the same grace and blessings and mercy and your relenting. I do not want them to have that compassion that you have for everyone else. They don't deserve it. Does that sound familiar? Does that, does that get you right here a little bit? It does me. Okay. So <laughs> this is so then Jonah, this is Jonah pitching a fit. He's throwing a little tantrum. He says, now, oh Lord, take my life for it's better for me to die than to live. I don't want to live in a world where the Ninevites get compassion and grace and mercy. They don't deserve it. I just want to die instead. But the Lord replied, have you any right to be angry? Jonah, do you hear yourself right now? Do you hear what you're saying to me? Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city. And there he made himself a shelter and sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. Ooh, he wanted it to just burn. He wanted there to be utter destruction. But he got away from it so he could just kind of watch it happen. Then the Lord God, look, then the Lord God, because this is the desert, y'all. This is the desert. Then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease Shade for his head to ease his discomfort, and Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the vine so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint, and he wanted to die. And he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. Jonah's still sitting in that. Look, God, God gave him this vine to shelter him and shade him, and, and Jonah was so happy. Don't you know the Lord was like, I'm going to give him a minute to stew in this anger. Don't let him calm down. We're going to give him a minute to stew in this anger that he has. He's going to cool off under this shade, and then, <laughs> and then he's going to get over it, and he's going to repent and again say, I'm sorry, you are God. Who am I? I've been in the belly of a whale. You feel real strongly about this. You have a plan. And by morning, Jonah was still mad, still mad, still ticked about this. So a worm came and ate the vine and it died. And Jonah got hot again and then he wants to die again. But God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I do have a right. I am angry enough to die. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. You got attached to it in those 24 hours. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? Just like we go back to Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, by the time that, that 
the Lord sends the angels, they're like, if you could just find 10 righteous people, I'll save it. I will save Sodom and Gomorrah if you can just find 10. God was willing to relent for just 10 people out of a lot of people. That's a small percentage. So he's saying here, he's willing, historically, he's willing to relent for 10. But there are at least 120,000 adults that doesn't count all the children and all the other folks. There are 20, 120,000 people, and God is not willing to lose one of them. He doesn't want to lose one of them. He wants them to have the opportunity to turn and repent. This story reminds me so much of the prodigal son in Luke. So let's go to Luke 15. We got all kinds of people coming and going in here today. There's Logan. Hey, Logan. We've had Sally. That was Sally, right? We've had Sally Key Bowden in here. Paul came through. So if I seem a little distracted, that's why. See, I'm distracted now talking about it. <laughs> okay, so the prodigal son is in Luke 15. It starts, I'm not going to read all of it to you. Aren't you so glad? Um, so it starts, we know the prodigal son, right? The, the, the youngest son says, hey, I'm, I'm just the second born. I'm not going to get all this stuff. It's all going to go to my brother. I will get a portion. So, Dad, I want it now. I want it now. I want to do, I want to take my inheritance and go now. And this dad says, okay, sure, sure, that's fine. The son goes and does, and guess what? It doesn't go well. He burns through it pretty quickly, and he ends up in a mess. He ends up in a mess. He ends up taking care of pigs. And do you know for, for Jewish people how disgusting that would be? Pigs are considered like the dirtiest of the dirty. They're disgusting. They eat anything. They wallow around in mud in their own mess. They just are gross. So that says something about him working with pigs like he was the bottom of the barrel he's sleeping in a pig pen with them and while he's lying there with his face down in the slop he says y'all I mean I make up details I'm sorry because um, this is how I see it in my mind um, he le he says I am better off to go home and work for my dad I have made a mistake I am better off to return home I, I should just go on home and at least I can work for my dad because he treats his servants better than these people are treating me. I'm going to go home. So he goes home. Okay? And you're like, Emily, this has nothing to do with Jonah and Nineveh. Wait. Just wait for it. Okay? But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw him his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So that they began to celebrate. The coolest, the coolest thing about this whole, that little bit that I just read is in verse 20 when it says, but, the, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion and he ran to his son. He saw him coming and he went out to meet him. Yeah, I know you did wrong. I know you, you were making mistakes. I know you did that, but... I'm just glad you came back. I'm just glad you're back. Oh my gosh, I love you. I missed you. Welcome back. Here's, that's God welcoming people back in. Welcoming them back into that holy standard. Here is where we, we really see this connection. Okay? Listen. Pay attention now. Meanwhile... The older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. What is going on? So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf, and, and because, he is in back, because he has him back safe and sound. 
the older brother became angry and refused to go in. See, now y'all are catching on. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. See? See? We think that the story, we think that the story of the prodigal son is about the prodigal son returning. We think that that's the greatest message. Oh, God ran out. He oh, he met him. The father met him and brought him back in and said, you're forgiven. Here, let's have a party. I'm just glad you're here. I don't care what you've been through. Let's not even talk about it. I don't need to know details. I don't need to know what all you did. It's behind us. You're home now. That's all that matters. The story is, for believers, <clears throat> the older brother, the Jonas of the world, which I don't know about any of you, but I'm an oldest child. And I can identify with, are you care? I do everything. Mama, I know you're watching. Uh, I do everything. My mother is an oldest child, too, so she gets what I'm saying here. I do everything. I hold this family together. I'm the one that comes and sees about the stuff. I'm the one that does everything. I'm the one that follows the rules. I'm the one that calls you and checks on you. I'm the one that does all of this. <sighs> and they get whatever they want. The babies get everything they want. My husband is an oldest too, so we, we do have this discussion at our house. Y'all probably know my, my sister-in-laws, my, my sisters, and my brother. Don't, don't, don't tell them I said this. But we get frustrated because we feel like we're missing out because we're not getting the accolades and the affirmation that we want. We're not getting that. And instead of rejoicing, my gosh, my brother is home my gosh, this whole city, I just preached a message. I just brought the word to this pagan city. And I'll be there. Every single one of them has repented. Praise God, I'm a preacher. I'm an evangelist. Whew. I'm going to get a TV show. I'm going to get a traveling caravan to follow me around. No, can you imagine seeing that, seeing the whole city repent, even the king? And you're still just so mad that you can't even enjoy what God has used you for. I, Y'all, I struggle with this a good bit. I'm a Jonah. I'm an older brother. I'm working on it. I really am working on it. Because we can't count somebody out. We can't discount what the Lord has for other people because it might mess up with what we want or what we think we're entitled to. Or we don't think that God's right. We think that that's wrong. They shouldn't get that. They shouldn't get a second chance. They shouldn't get redemption. They shouldn't get your grace and mercy and love, God. They don't deserve it. We want to be the ones who decide. Or I do. I'm not as compassionate. I'm more of a black and white kind of girl. That's wrong. We shouldn't do that. Times have changed. Oh, it doesn't matter. That's wrong. You don't behave that way. <laughs> you, you can't do that. You can't do it. Over the past year and since this, you know, quarantine, COVID, 2020 is a blur. I don't know when I heard this. I don't know what it was in reference to. But I do know that it was Louis Giglio that said it. And I don't know what he was preaching on this sermon that I listened to. But he was talking about, oh, yes, I do. I remember now. <laughs> came back to me. Um, he was talking about, is this the end times? You know, all of the unrest, all, oh, there's a plague, there's a pandemic. <laughs> is the world, is Jesus coming back? 
Is this the end? And don't we use sometimes say, this was so profound to me. It really, it really hit me because how many times have I said, ah, oh, Jesus, just come back. This is too hard. This is too upsetting. This is, ah, oh, this is a mess. I can't, I mean, what are my children going to do? What, what, it, how are they going to live? How, how are we going to go on in the mess that we've made for ourselves? We've made all these decisions and now we're going to have to live into the consequences. Gosh, Jesus, just come back. Let's just go to heaven. Let's just let that go and let's just move on to the new heaven. Let's, let's go home. I want to be with the Lord. I just want to go. I want this to be over. I mean, we, we say that and that's normal. We have that longing because this is not our home, right? But here was Louis's point. He said that we shouldn't be so impatient for Jesus to come back because once he does, there's destruction. Once he comes back, there is not the opportunity to repent and turn back. It'll be Sodom and Gomorrah. It will have the same fate as the Ninevites. And we have to be okay and willing to be on God's team and with him and do the things that he directs us to do and calls us to do. We have to be able to do that regardless of what we think. Regardless if we think it's a good idea, regardless if we think that, that it's unfair, that we're not getting what we're owed. We have to follow what God is leading us to do. Or you might end up in a pit, in the belly of a whale. Or you might end up under a vine that's going to wither and die. Or you might miss celebrating. Don't let your resentment and your bitterness and your whiny, oh, it's not fair keep you from enjoying the blessings of God. See, there's a lot in Jonah, those three little cha uh, four little chapters. Short chapters, actually. It feels like only one or two. There's a lot in there. And we can learn a lot from Jonah. We can learn a lot from the whole Bible. And you might read it, when you sit back down and read it, you might read it and think of other references and other things. You might be reminded of times when you've seen this. And when it becomes live and real to you, it's when you're going to see a change. So my friends, whew, let's not be Jonah. Let's not be the older brother. Let's not be the Sodomites and Gomorrahites. We can't, let's not be naughty Ninevites. Let's be the redeemed, <laughs> repented Ninevites. So after, so this is it. Joan is it. I'm not going to take a break next week. Teresa, is that okay? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to take a break because we've already had too many breaks. And we're getting into summer where people are going to go and travel. And I just hadn't decided what's going to happen <sighs> over the summer. Because <clears throat> I do have children. And they wear me out. So, um, I'm going to do next, we're going to talk about the parables of Jesus. This is going to be so good. I'm so excited. So, tune in next week and we'll start with the parables of Jesus, okay? Thank y'all so much. Love you. Have a great week. Hi. Bye. See you next week. <laughs>